and I will focus on representations of sound in landscape architecture. My thesis work was very much about um, the experience of sound, but I approached it through a kind of understanding um, that included noise. So my work was very much uh, about thinking about how can we deal with noise in a way that is uh, kind of in line with the landscape architect's way of working. And <coughs> this uh, part of th uh, the kind of approaches that I was working with as, as in, in the thesis is exemplified in uh, this image from a Renaissance garden in Italy, Villa d'Este, which is a fountain. And this is a very early example in, in landscape architecture of the use of, of water features in uh, to produce sound. And as I noticed uh, in uh, some of my visits in, in Japanese gardens, these uh, water features can be used to, to enhance um, the experience in many ways, not least because it reduces the impact of noise. And uh, my background for going into the topic of sound in landscape architecture is very much that I'm coming from, from music. Uh, I've been working playing a lot of music and I've been uh, um, recording music and uh, <coughs> working with music in, in many different ways. And uh, as I was studying for landscape architecture, I realized gradually that there is a lot of unexplored potential for sound. It has been argued uh, quite repeatedly that sound is an uh, under-prioritized aspect and this was something I noticed as well in, when I was getting into landscape architecture. So the thesis work in very much was a way of, for me, an opportunity to combine my two big uh, interests of music and landscape architecture. And as I will come back to, they, they are <coughs> sometimes overlapping and the borders are not so distinct. And <coughs> um, so, <clears throat> I mentioned this briefly, there is a, uh, a notion of a visual focus within the discipline. And uh, this has not only been noticed by me, but also by several authors uh, <clears throat> before uh, I started to work with, with sound. And, uh, and it seems that it's particularly related to the modernistic tradition. It started uh, around the mid-20th centuries, for instance, exemplified by Stian Eiler Rasmussen's experiencing architecture. Uh, and then um, perhaps culminating during the postmodern era of 1980s and 1990s with uh, Palasma's famous uh, book, The Eyes of the Skin, for instance, and there are many other examples as well. And, and the argument was, very much that um, if sound is considered in landscape architecture or architectural disciplines in general, it is tended to focus on noise, and um, while other aspects are forgotten. And <coughs> this was one of the things I uh, examined in, in my thesis work, if this was true as a starting point for, for going into it. But before I come back to what I found, um, this is an image there has been many attempts to try and explain what the reason is for this visual focus within the discipline. And it has been also connected to a visual focus for the Western society as a whole. So there, there is something, this is something that is discussed in uh, idea, the history of ideas and philosophic, philosophical discourses. Um, and sometimes it was mentioned in the books I was studying that the, the notion of the central perspective had a big influence on, on the way that, for instance, the uh, Western art and, and uh, architectural discipline have been working. And this is also a good Im image. This is from the Renaissance and uh, Count Johann, the window grid from 1531, which exemplifies uh, the situation in which many uh, landscape architects work with today. I think it is a good uh, representation of how we are sitting indoors to design something which is actually outdoors. And this is something I noticed when I was in Japan. There is a, a long tradition of working outdoors rather than indoors. So this is um, 
something we have to adapt to as landscape architects when we're working with the outdoor environments. We're working indoor with something that is outdoor in the most cases. But, uh, which makes it really important that we have good representational tools for uh, working with sound. And this is the topic for, for the presentation today then, to raise some examples of how we can represent sound even though we are working indoors. We, we should also be able to represent sound. And the most uh, established method is, of course, the noise map, which I will return to and raise that and other examples as well. But first, I want to say a few words about if <clears throat> the critique is valid, what I found. Uh, many of the sources that I mentioned previously were have quite a, a harsh critique for the field, but when I studied some of the literature and some of the projects, I already mentioned how Japan, for instance, has a rich tradition of working with sound. It seems like it has been a little bit one-dimensional, and um, it is true to some extent, but not for all regions, not for all practitioners, and not for all projects. So there are many examples uh, <coughs> throughout history. We have already seen examples from Greek theatres earlier today, and there are <coughs> the Italian Renaissance gardens, there are some uh, examples in, in the Japanese garden tradition, for instance, Already in the 11th century, in the Tale of Genji, which is a famous novel in, in, in Japan, it is stated uh, the stream above the waterfall was cleared out and deepened to a considerable distance, and that the noise of the cascade might carry further, he set great boulders in midstream against which the current crashed and broke. And so this illustrates how this is something, sound has been something that is um, important in this tradition already more than a thousand years ago. And I also experienced several examples of this very technique today when I visited gardens, this, in this case, Xinan Garden from the early 1900s. Well, what about contemporary practice? Um, to the extent that we can call 1967 contemporary, uh, the most famous example of working with sound in landscape architecture is perhaps Paley Park in New York, which is an urban pocket park, which is interesting because they included a waterfall um, as one of the walls of three three-walled secluded garden, which mask out the sound from the surrounding city and create a kind of privacy. It's quite loud space, but um, it has been studied by William White, for instance, who, who noticed that one reason that it was, uh, seemed to be popular was that the sound from the waterfall created a kind of privacy. There are also examples of um, working with masking strategies together with uh, screens to create an even further enhanced effect, as this example in Sheffield illustrates and the uh, projects which are m more closely related to music, which the sea organ in Sada illustrates, um, <coughs> which is an organ essentially driven by the sea, the sound of sea waves. The pipes are kind of the air from the th water dr drives the sound in those pipes. So to sum up, uh, there are a few examples of how we can work with sound in contemporary landscape architecture, uh, but it could be higher prioritized. These are all examples that have kind of a thematic approach to working with sound and has made it kind of a thing. And um, moreover, many of the tools that we are working with are still visually oriented. And there's also a separation between acousticians and architectural disciplines that could be further elaborated. This was one of the findings of my thesis work. So, this is why it's so important to <coughs> look into the representational methods. We have, as we have already come into contact with earlier today, the noise map, which is a very useful tool and a very well-established tool, but um, as 
we know it is not possible, it is not all inclusive. There are many things that it does not say. So there has been attempts to, to work in the same kind of overview way and then work with illustrative techniques to kind of give a more precise idea about what kind of sounds is it, because the noise map is only giving us the sound pressure levels. For instance, if it's an ocean, it does not necessarily say us anything about the experience. So in this way, we can kind of, uh, for instance, the first plan here is an example by, drawn by Per Heat Fosch, who is a landscape architect who was working with sound in the early 20, 21st century and using different colors to <coughs> represent different types of, of sound, for instance, if the sound is a moving sound. And then uh, Vogiatsis and Remy, who did a survey in Greece, used different symbols to represent sound in an urban environment. A section drawing is another classical way of representing landscape architecture visually, which is also highly interesting from a sonic perspective because it gives us uh, a very good sense of spatiality and how spa uh, sound travels in space. And we saw some examples of the section drawing earlier today. And uh, this is an example from uh, Norman Booth from 1983, where he drew uh, the sound of traffic, and call it noise, from <coughs> the road, and then gradually going through the waterway, and then it becomes sound from water structure. So this is also an example of how we can illustrate a masking situation. Another very important tool for landscape architects is the writing, the pen. And... Uh, the American landscape architect Lawrence Halprin is, is famous for his, uh, together with Anna Halprin, his orchestration or his uh, choreography of, of landscape architecture, architecture project. He is also very interesting from the point of view of writing because, for instance, here he uses an onomatopoeic language to describe the sound of water for <coughs> one of water features uh, which he has been working on when he says that water has sounds as well. It gurgles, it splashes, it goes plop, 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 and fsh, and spats. And this is from 1963. And there's also another example by Lawrence Halprin, which he uses when he, d he recollects his, in, in the introduction to this book, he re recollects his favorite urban experience that he has been having, and it's of course from Venice, which is a recurring theme when you're studying the landscape architecture literature on sound, because Venice has no cars, so there is a lot of more opportunity for dynamics of sound to come forward. So <coughs> he says, there was no sound, no automobile exhausts, no buses, absolutely quiet in the very heart of a great city. In the distance, you could hear faintly some young people singing, all of a sudden, the air became dark with birds, the square filled with the beating of thousands of wings. The noise increased and increased until it was deafening, and the deserted square became absolutely filled with pigeons. The noise was incredible, even frightening. They had come to feed, and when they had finished, they left just as quickly, and the great square was empty and quiet again. So there is um, almost this sense of poetic character to, to this, this way of <coughs> describing landscape architecture projects or landscape experiences. Um, another technique which is um, perhaps even more common today when we have access to computers and um, more accessible ways to combining different data is the collage, which is exemplified here by a a piece drawn by Jamie McCutcheonson and uh, presented in a in an article by Michael Fowler. So, Hutchinson uses different colors to represent different 
vehicles or different sources for, for sound. For instance, people sound has one color and then the train sound has another color. <coughs> and the urban hubbub the, or the background noise has another color. And then he also puts a timeline so you can follow how these different sounds vary over time. Because time is a, is a very important dimension which is quite difficult to represent in landscape architecture for sound. And uh, one which is, can be very important, for instance, if, it, if it, there is a variation over the day, hours, and so on. And the, it is also interesting, and there is another example of o use of onomatopoetic words and kind of almost blending the borders between what is an image and what is a, a text. Uh, soundscape researchers um, have come up with a thing called chatty maps. We're coming into a section now which will be dealing a little bit more with new techniques uh, related to social media and uh, digitalization of society. And the, the soundscape community has grown uh, expen exponentially in the last 10, 15 years. So there are many people working with this now, and many of them have knowledge of these new kinds of techniques. So this is an example of uh, a research group that was collecting data from, they were mapping sound types and emotional responses using social media data. Uh, the tags that were associated with the image were, images were used to collect uh, data about the types of sound that were found, in this case in Barcelona. So we can say <coughs> they have divided the sounds in red for transport, green for nature, blue for human, and orange for music, and then a brown, blackish for, for indoor sound. And this, I think, uh <coughs> this is the, m the most dominant sounds then that uh, they choose a, co a color for each section. And this is a quite interesting way to, to put a nuance on a noise map if you combine these two, two ways, I think. Another social media kind of um, approach is the Hush City app by Antonella Radici. And uh, this is a uh, kind of user-based, uh, she's using it for, for research purposes partly, but it is also a very convenient way to, for uh, citizens to map and uh, find quiet areas uh, subjectively then. So uh, users can log into the application and they add, a, they do a short recording of the, the sound environment they're mapping and then, they're uh, adding some tags to describing why they choose this particular place and what kind of associations they get, how they relate to people based on this uh, and other factors. So uh, <coughs> this is an application, one way of uh, representing sound. Then you can collect the data and you can get maps that overview the data, the noise pressure levels. It's also a way of collecting noise data, of course even though this is uh, a little bit unreliable, perhaps because of the calibration of co uh, mobile phones. Another mobile phone application, which is also uh, based on partly on recording data, is the Soundscape Characterization Tool by Perhiad Fosch, uh, which is uh, more directed to the practice of landscape architecture and uh, urban planners. Uh, which is uh, essentially a, a way of uh, to help to categorize, to help put descriptions, to put words on different um, areas. And uh, one of the there are eight categories in total in this application, and one of them is onomatopoetics. So it comes back the use of onomatopoetic words. Uh, I wanted to say a few words about oralization, even though it's um, basically a uh, technique which is based on, on sound reproduction. We have already heard quite a lot about oralization earlier today, which was very interesting. Um, but this is a technique that is uh, becoming more and more accessible. And uh, it's a very 
useful, I, I believe, for future applications because it makes it possible to, to, to sketch in real time to see how different solutions in the landscape environment influence um, the propagation of sound and then also how, how we listen to an environment. Field recordings is also sound representation but I want to mention it here because it can be combined with visual data in a quite interesting ways. And of course it made possible by Thomas Alva Edison when he introduced the phonograph in 1878. But now it's become so much more accessible. So almost as easy as a digital camera to use. Um, it is very interesting, like I said, because it can be combined. For instance, it can be used as part of a, a plan drawing of uh, landscape architecture projects that you can click on sound information for various sites. It can be used to, com to produce videos, to produce slideshows, or to make collage. As in this example here, Audible Dwelling by Sandra Koplar, who did research on uh, how a site can be transformed by adding sound before it's, it is built, so it kind of helped practitioner, for instance, to, to um, gain an insight into how some future changes would influence the site. And back to the research community, the soundscape researchers, uh, which has been developing a, uh, different kinds of models for kind of conceptualizing sound environments. And uh, here are two examples. Again, one from Herd, Per Hedfors, which is, makes a distinction between figure and background sounds. And uh, based on the amount of figure on the one hand and background on the other hand, we can position a soundscape in this um, <clears throat> these kind of four uh, different kinds of soundscape, going from mild soundscape to powerful soundscape, if it's a lot of figure and background sounds at the same time. Another model which is quite influential in the soundscape community is Pleasantness and Eventfulness by Axel Son, Nilsson and Berg Lund from 2010 here, which is based, it's uh, related, but it's based on pleasantness and eventfulness and put these two in, in a kind of axis situation where we get monotonous, exciting, calm and chaotic soundscapes, depending on where in this framework we end up. <coughs> I have uh, two more examples before finishing and the first one, both are a little bit phenomenological, so it's uh, different examples of how you can capture the movement through space. This is a interesting method by Nina Helgen, who quite recently presented her thesis on, on urban sound, which is uh, a little bit related to the noise map, but there are some more subtle information added, which can be, for instance, we can see how the noise is quite rapidly diminishing around a corner and this create uh, not only a change in sound pressure level but also a kind of experiential effect. So uh, for instance there is an effect called cutout when you are doing a transition from a very loud space to a very quiet space. It, be it can become, seem to be very tranquil because of the contrast effect there. So this is an example of a <coughs> phenomenological Mapping and here is another example which looks a little bit like a musical score. This is from Versailles and Catherine Zanto who uh, did her thesis work in this garden uh, trying to Gather how it was to be working uh, to be walking in this garden around the time of the 18th century and One of the there are several axes in this uh, for instance fragrance and views and 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 one of them is is sound and we can see how how the sound level is is changing. That's the sound level that she has been 
working on her, but she has also been doing some developments of this specific specifically for sound, for instance, close sounds, further away sounds, and how sound can attract people to a certain space. Because we hear something, we want to walk and explore it further. So I think this is very interesting because it looks a little bit like a musical score and it kind of puts the finger of how, how uh, <clears throat> sound in the landscape is actually not so far away from, from music in, in some times. Um, finally, to conclude, as we saw some examples of uh, earlier projects, there are increased interest for sound in landscape architecture and also within academia there is a <coughs> really increase for soundscape research and how it can be applied in planning situations. There are also many different approaches to, to represent sound. There is not one solution, but rather uh, quite a few and, and much more than I've been able to uh, give today. But uh, I think it's reflecting the complexity of uh, <coughs> the topic and the many different ways we can understand and interpret sounds in the environment. There are also some new and promising computer-based methods that I think uh, will have uh, quite a lot of influence in the future. And with this, uh, I want to thank you. And if you want to, thank you for listening. And if you want to uh, see more of these examples and listen to more s sound clips, uh, I have put some, some examples together at this web page, soundscapedesign.info. So this was um, uh, the development of this was partly supported by the Sound Environment Center, and it's been quite recently into an English version as well. It's aimed at planners and designers of urban sound. <coughs> so thank you for for listening. Thank you, Gunnar. <coughs>